Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Inland Solutions for Intermodal Efficiency, sponsored by IMC Companies. I would now like to introduce today's panel, Donna Lem, Chief Commercial Officer, and Mason George, President, IMC National Accounts. Thanks, David. Uh, happy to be here. And as he was saying, and also want to thank IANA for putting on this webinar. My name is Mason George. I'm the president of IMC Companies National Accounts, and I've got Donna Lim as our chief commercial officer. Well, I'm delighted to be here and uh, also um, thank IANA and um, really looking forward to this afternoon's webinar. Um, Mason, uh, start us off. Well, so IMC Companies is a family of brands, and we have Atlantic Intermodal Services, which is AIS, located on the southeast, GIS, which is Gulf Intermodal Services, located in the Gulf, H&M in New York and Pennsylvania, and uh, PDS, which is our employee, our employee asset company, Pacific Trade Services on the West Coast. D&J is our Midwest inland carrier, along with IMCG, our Southeast carrier, and OIS is our Ohio Valley asset provider. So we feel like we're pretty uniquely poised to talk about inland intermodal solutions. IMC was originally created in 1982 in one terminal in Memphis, Tennessee, with ideas on how we can better improve processes for our drivers, as well as customers to and from the railroads. You can see our national map here, uh, located all over the United States in the 48, uh, except for the place of, of Miami, everywhere else, uh, we have terminals and drivers and trucks here to help uh, assist in intermodal drayage all over the country. So I wanted to start us off um, and maybe just uh, level uh, level set a little bit. Um, what's the current state of our U.S. intermodal industry? It's been a, a real rocky year and a, a tough year, and shall we say, couple of years. But what's so interesting for all of us is right now we're in this place of calm. And perhaps this calm, not really sure what the next quarter will bring. But let's talk a little bit about 2022 for a second. If we look at this graph, and I think Larry Gross um, from his weekly in-depth uh, flashes, I follow our numbers every week, but the numbers resonate to us. This graph does. Uh, we remember in the beginning of 2022, while there, were, there was very little volume moving IPI, and, you know, a lot of uh, discussion, perhaps ocean carriers weren't moving inland at the time, weren't giving bookings IPI. We certainly were still very, very busy as a community, and we were still playing cleanup from 2021. The freight began to come, and we felt kind of the surge as March began, and we usually do see this uptick around March, and the freight began to continue to climb moving those deficit numbers that the beginning of 2022 saw to almost a level playing field. But then what happened? What happened is the freight continued to come sometime in third quarter. The pileup was clearly there. We, as Mason said, have intermodal terminals, depots, CYs all over the interior of the United States, and they were full. We had trains coming in, and frankly, those terminals were full. We saw grounding where Kansas City, Chicago, Memphis, Nashville, Dallas, all of our in Ohio Valley, we were literally on the ground in every inland hub in, in the US. And as we again began to clean up, that dip that you see in November was so drastic that I think all of us kind of just stopped and went, what happened to the freight? We have a couple of reasons why. Um, and are we indeed just a part of a whole global supply chain that pretty much put the brakes on? Yeah, of course we are. We're part of that, that global supply chain system. We also had anxiety. Did we have a rail strike? Were our customers looking at other alternative gateways? Absolutely. So we have a lot of things going on here. We enter into quarter one. We want to take a few minutes today to take a look at what we did right, what we could have done better to drive efficiency. We're going to share with you some of the things that we did. I want to take another quick look, and we'll go to the next slide, about our international numbers um, specifically. 
So this graph absolutely mirrors the one that I just showed you. But if you'll follow the blue line, the blue line talks about our international freight. Um, the same dips that we talked about, pretty drastic as we began the year. And then uh, again, that line as it kind of escalated up through the summer months, uh, bringing us to that third quarter in September when we just went at the end of third quarter, wow. Um, so with that, we're gonna go to the next slide, um, dive a little bit deeper into um, 2022. We have to understand what the problems were before we can begin to fix them. So Mason, I'm gonna turn this one over to you. Yeah, and, and Donna, what I would say makes this space so difficult is that 2022 was a tale of just two timeframes and two situations that were totally different from each other. The first three quarters, there was a lot of stress on our infrastructure to get more containers through the system. And I mean, I think we've all said this a million times, the infrastructure that we had in place during this post-pandemic world was just not adequate to handle the amount of volume that was coming through. So when you look at what space we have at rails and ports, we don't have enough space to have all of those containers mounted on chassis. And as a result, the industry had to go vertical. And as we went vertical, that put more demands on lifts and grounded containers snowballed into further congestion and multiple lifts to outgate one container. Then what we also saw was this element where there were so many containers in the system and on the street that warehouses and BCOs and 3PLs only wanted to unload what was absolutely vital to their supply chain and what was missing on the shelves. So in a normal environment and kind of what we're seeing today, we would have a lot more containers deliver from the rail to a distribution center where they were worked almost immediately. But that oh, in the first two quarters and the year before, our three quarters in the year before, that was just not, not there. Everything was getting pre-pulled to a yard. Chassis were being overutilized in a market that was used to only probably having maybe two thirds or even half utilization over a month's time. This also put a lot of stress on the warehouses and there's not a lot of room to work. You can have gridlock at rails and terminals, but you can also have gridlock inside of warehouses. If you need to have enough room to work your product and forklifts and outbound, and it doesn't do you any good if all the inbounds clogging up where you can't do anything on the outbound. This obviously was also a really big stress on our drivers. We went from a two-legged base system where we would pick up a container from the rail, go to the warehouse and take it back to the rail to now a four-legged system, taking from the rail to our yard, from the yard to the customer and from the customer back to the rail. Obviously this sucked up a lot of driver capacity, which just in turn helped further the problem that we had back in 2022. <clears throat> As an example here, these were our driver wait times over the last three years. And you can see the gray bar is somewhere near 30 to 45 minutes for every container in and out of Memphis. What this turns into is that a driver is able to do seven and eight legs per day. Now, when you wait an hour and a half and two and three times longer at each rail, you're down to two and three moves a day total. This is really uh, a major issue for us internally and also for the customer who needs to get their product and get in the right boxes in and out of the rail to their DCs as quickly as they can. I think one of the things to, to note, even on the slide, I mean, the green bar in 2021, uh, the whole system just went into shock. These numbers doubling in driver wait time, literally 90, 90, 92% increases in some cases from 2020 to 2021. 2022 doesn't look a whole heck of a lot better. And remember, we had roughly six, uh, about a 6% decline in overall freight uh, for the year. So just wanted to, um, as Mason said, just reiterate, these wait times are so critical for our driver. But the truth is, it's everybody in the supply chain. Uh, when we get congested, nobody wins. What's the impact? Bottom line, stop. It's, it's time and money. And when we're grounding equipment, that railroad is not winning. Um, the struggle with the rail is they want to continue to have space so that they continue to move trains. Our ocean carriers aren't winning. That asset is grounded, can't move. For us as motor carriers, our drivers can't make money unless they're moving. And our customers, our customers are the one that ultimately felt 
the, uh, the magnitude of the pain. There were many customers, and Mason talks about warehousing. There are many customers that did struggle with warehousing problems, with labor issues and being able to unload. But there were also that, that small tier and mid tier customer, many 3PLs out there representing a, a multitude of these smaller mid tier customers that desperately needed their freight, couldn't get it. What's the cost of that? It's tremendous. We have in some areas of the country uh, seen the storage costs, demerge slash storage costs escalate over 3,000% from 2020 to 2022. That impact is huge. And at the end of the day, nothing in life is free. Someone felt that economic pain. And we all, at the end of the day, knew who that was. Mark, we talked about, Mason, the extra legs, the two legs that moved to four legs, that in some cases moved to six legs as we tried to return those empties. And then we haven't talked a lot about chassis, just the, the pain in chassis splits. My friend Joel Henry at IMCG reminds me all the time that about 30% of our driver's time is spent chasing chassis. So huge issue, time and money. Let's go to the next slide and talk about some of the things we did to provide um, inland solution where there was a crisis. Yeah, so IMC was one of the early pioneers in the pop-up yard solution. And essentially what this pop-up yard is, simply put, is we store BCO boxes that can't deliver right away. And the idea really is nothing that's groundbreaking by any means. It just takes a lot of work. If you think about a, a traditional CY, and we've been doing this since the early 80s, we take empty containers back to our yard and we hold them for export. Those boxes are stacked by steamship line and size typically, and there's not a particular order on how you get those guys out. And most of the time, it is in the first in, last out atmosphere. Well, when you're dealing with loaded containers from BCOs as a true import pop-up yard, you have some difficulties with that. There's certain product on every container, so every box is unique. There's certain product inside that container that might be there early or late or too late to even matter anymore, and we have to sort through that the best we can. A lot of our importing community was shell-shocked from the 2021 era and they decided to bring their product in for Christmas way early, which we saw that in the spike of the numbers. But what do you do with Christmas trees that are inside of a container that, that the warehouse can't, frankly, unload at this time? So what you have to do is create a yard system that can stack these containers, which is what they're meant to be, and sort these by destination and like customers so we can get this product delivered on time to that BCO. And really, this takes just a lot of lifts takes manpower to drive those lifts almost 24 hours a day so we can groom the stacks at night and have drivers delivering throughout, throughout the day. We have dedicated drayage assets that work our yards to help turn the yard over to look for a certain container that wasn't hot yesterday, but all of a sudden is hot today. We have scalable technology and the amount of money that we have spent in this is just unheard of to try to get our yard in a system that's reliable and that also works well with hey, this box is delivering on a Tuesday, make sure that the lift drivers communicated systematically with the drayage truck so everybody's on the same page. Then we also have this huge issue with steamship line empty terminations. At one point, we were never even aware of what a rail allocation was, but we all of a sudden found this, this problem in the sense that we're storing empties for steamship lines and BCOs are creating empties, but rails can't take anything else either. So we have this surplus of empties that are on our yard and how do we get those off our yard as quickly as we can while maintaining a healthy BCO pop-up yard that's efficiently serving the customer and our drivers. Well, so true. And I also, you know, want to bring up our exporters. Our exporters were struggling. And as they're loading um, and they've got loaded exports, we had problems with uh, rolling receiving dates at all of our uh, rail hubs throughout the country, especially um, as many of our customers were, were really struggling to go east and west quite frankly. And so where were these exporters going to go? So here we are with our terminals, our pop-ups, our yards. Mason talks about just the surplus of loaded containers that are now being stacked, empties being stacked, and exporters with loads that can't go anywhere. It was very, very interesting 
time not too long ago, just a couple of months ago. Mason, talk about the scalable technology that we have to do. I think, you know, we talk about being one of the first <clears throat> pop-ups, but this is not easy to do. Um, you got to know where that container is, what that container is. If you could maybe share a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a pretty difficult question. And what we're what we're tasked with is is pretty much creating a software solution that's integrated with our container yard operation as well as our application for third party drivers and other vendors who are coming to pick up boxes from this yard and also our facility. So some people can say it can be done with a simple website, but there's a lot more to that with optimizing a network and also being dynamic and being able to dispatch that to the drivers. So one of the things that we did is we created this smart stack, stack concept where we combine like cargo and like destinations into one stack. And the way that we've always approached this is a container comes into the facility on a Friday afternoon that's not designated to deliver until Wednesday the following week. If it's within a certain range where the drivers are, no, we know that they will be acceptable to say, hey, I'm not going to go 400 miles today, but I will go 50 miles today. We put all that cargo into one stack, like destination, like size and weight, and dispatch it out to the carriers that way. So as they come through our yard, we are able to pick the top box, give it to the driver on the outbound, and then deliver that to the customer within their expectations. The beauty of that is that it absolutely is a time saver. If you think about if a driver who goes in for a single single box to a, a rail or port, and they have to do three or four digs to get to that, and the guy behind them has to do three or four digs to take that, and the guy behind that guy has to do five or six digs, everybody can add that math up pretty quickly. It's an exponential lift problem, as well as just causing havoc within um, the terminal and ports and, and what our drivers are doing on a daily basis. So we kind of stopped all production on everything else within our IT group and sent our team out to solve this issue, which we're really proud about. What I love about smart stacks is the collaboration, the collaboration that we do work with our ports, uh, with our railroads, our shippers, our vendors, our drivers. And for me, the way that I, I translate smart stacks is we have typically done things one container at a time. Smart Stacks allows us efficiency by bringing our drivers and chassis in for that arriving train, evacuating terminals uh, one at a time, hundreds of a at a time. In the meantime, as, as Mason points out, going to our off dock CY, to our terminal, wherever it is, where we have that lift equipment, that becomes so critical. And it's there that um, Mason and team coordinates through smart stacks, the efficiencies of putting those into piles absolutely where they need to go. So what we're, we're running into now, and this is more so, more towards the fourth quarter of 2022, there's less volume in the system. So there's less of a need to take everything to a pop-up yard and store it. But you still have some of that going on along with how do you pick up containers directly from a rail car and take it to the door? That's the most efficient a terminal can be is when we have containers that are able to go to the DC, we pick that thing up and we go right to the customer. Customer's happy because they're getting it as quickly as they can. And the railroad really doesn't understand the difference. And they're happy with it too, in the sense that cargo is moving through their facility as quickly as possible. They don't have to understand that it's going directly to the pop-up yard or even to the customer directly. But that's a huge innovation that we're continuing to push is how do we dynamically up to the very last second, have that driver pick the box take it to the right location no matter what. This has allowed our internal network to optimize our driver capacity as well as customer satisfaction. And then also moving from one container at a time to hundreds of containers at a time out of certain terminals in an evacuating scenario. I love that. I love what you said too about 2022. Here we are late fourth quarter right now in January, and we have a whole different scenario. And perhaps the immediate need to evacuate off of terminals isn't there, but it's so important that we don't go backwards. Um, the problems that we had in COVID were not isolated. We had similar problems. We can remember even 2018 where we were grounded. I remember uh, we had one incident where we had drivers taking pictures and they called it the wall, a wall of containers stacked six high. 
we want to be able to learn from all of these challenges and take this crisis and turn it into an opportunity. And so just as Mason said, we continue at IMC to optimize as best we can, taking advantage even of that last rail car to, to warehouse and optimizing that driver um, in that time as best as we can. Well, you know, with this, I, I really feel that we were in the right position to make these changes and respond to the market very quickly. I mean, IMC is the largest marine drainage company in the country. We have over 2,200 trucks, 16,000 chassis, and 700 acres of container parking. So that allows us to, number one, understand what's the trend and where's the market going, as well as responding live time to these customer needs. I mean, the pop-up yard wasn't uniquely ours. It was really just from the customers bubbling up. I've got a problem. How do you guys come up with a solution for us to, to continue to work here. So we like to think, we love this lot of scale, strength, and skill. It all brings it together here for the customer and the driver that we're trying to service in our industry. So with this, all of our yards have at some point been through a pretty radical transformation. We're adding load lifts, we're adding empty lifts. Our parking has just not been adequate enough and we're growing our footprint. So we offer secure short-term container storage for over 20,000 containers on a daily basis. And that gets pretty complicated when you're dealing with loaded, empty, single BCOs who are bringing something in but can't take it for a few weeks. There's a lot of, of work that goes into this. And we've done a really good job, I think, as IMC leading the industry with OCR technology for our drivers and at the gate to recognize what is coming in in a live system and a live atmosphere so that we can respond quickly to the needs and the changes of what our customers need on a daily basis. We haven't spoken a lot about chassis. Um, we did in the beginning about um, the chassis shortage, but it's so important that we continue to seek solution. As I said just a second ago, um, the problems may have been exacerbated by COVID, but they existed pre-COVID. Uh, and, and specifically with chassis, we've been trying to perhaps share the crux of the problem and we, IMC, are strong believers in chassis choice. What does that mean? Chassis choice simply meaning that there are no restrictions, that we can go in and out of port terminals and rail terminals, um, picking up our customers' freight. Um, that's our job. That's what we get paid to do. We are a strong believer in trucker-owned wheels, where we have the ability to deploy our private chassis and keep our wheels with our driver. There's no other country in the world that's taken the wheels away from the driver. And we wonder why it takes us longer. And we wonder why we're stuck when there are no wheels to, to be found. I mean, try to create a way to simplify this so that everybody understands that a chassis, that metal frame and those wheels, it's a utility. It is a critical component to move freight. Another thing, though, that we're trying to drive home in the inland, in the interior of the United States, is that there are still models that are pretty antiquated. And while 20 years ago, moving freight into the interior of the United States, it was natural that they would move in and there would be chassis waiting, just waiting when the train arrived. So that ocean carrier could put that chassis, had that, that railroad put that container on that chassis and go. How was a constant E or, or BCO charge? It was a unit. The wheels were part of the service portfolio. Take it back to 2010. We begin unbundling the chassis from the move, from the service. And what happens? Chaos happens. Remember, it's a critical component of the move. We still have many wheeled um, and sophisticated systems in the United States by railroads. We have both wheeled operations and partially wheeled operations. And what happens when the train's coming in, train doesn't know if that container is a merchant haulage move or a CY move. That train doesn't know if that box is a door move doesn't know. But now there are all these rules that when that train arrives, you better load that particular container on this type of chassis. Oh, and by the way, that second container, it needs to go on this type of chassis. And 
what we've done is complicate the model so much that it absolutely restricts flow. What we've been asking for, take the restrictions off, let the market drive itself. Let us have the freedom to go in and pick up our container on a CY merchant haulage move. There are many truckers that are listening in on this particular uh, webinar. They will tell you that if you can take the restrictions off, if you can go in and just go get that customer's freight, railroad, you're not going to have to ground the freight like crazy where it gets so stacked up. There were rules that were created in 2022 that inhibited and prohibited private chassis use. Why? Not to hurt anybody. The restrictions were put out there. No private chassis. Why? To hold accountable contracted parties responsible for chassis provision. It was a clear warning. There is accountability and there are agreements and arrangements to, to go get and provide chassis when the train arrives. I think if we just all stop for a bit and try to uncover what's working, what's not working, and continue to push for a better way, we're going to be in great shape. As Mason talked about the chassis that we have at IMC, we obviously were deploying our chassis where we have the freedom to use them. Where? At, at our port grounded facilities. We do have grounded facilities at many railroads. But what happens, and this is the thing that we all know all too well in, in our world, we are a system. And when we send a driver out to one grounded rail facility, we may be bringing that to a consignee and then picking up an export load and going to the next railroad, which happens to be a wheel facility. When you have this start, stop, green, blue, all these different factors that complicate the fluidity of the, the process, you got problems. So I love what Mason said earlier as, as we kind of um, went through this by ourselves. He said, you know, we just need to dumb it down. He's 100% right. We need to bring simplicity to a, a complicated system. And we can do that by just taking the restrictions off. And so for IMC, we're all about choice. We believe the optimal model is grounded trucker-owned wheels, but we also are believers in gray interoperable pools where we have these wheeled and partially wheeled facilities. Can you imagine, and it happens, can you imagine when the train arrives that there are chassis that are available, but we can't use them because there are these restrictions? If we had an interoperable environment where we could interchange the equipment, now I agree, I know that there are business models out there, but if we could agree that the standard was here, and we all agreed to the standard and agreed to this interoperability, that gray interoperable pool becomes a very, very viable option. Mason, anything you want to add to that? No, I think you hit the nail on the head of the issue. I mean, we're we're essentially it's a it's a piece of steel with some lights and wheels. And other than that, it just needs to be used as a utility to serve our customer and our driver because what we're doing right now is still unacceptable. It's unacceptable in a way that is centered around profit interest and not necessarily advancing the industry forward. And that's what we're here to do. We want to advance the industry simplify things for our drivers and our customers because they don't want to hear about our chassis woes. It's time we moved on with all that. And, and I feel like now is probably a, the best time, if ever, to point out all the flaws in the system of the past and to go forward in how we can accomplish this together as a true great pool and serve our customers the way that we need to. So with here, just a kind of a sound bite for IMC. You know, we're the largest marine drage company with 62,000 vendor drivers and company drivers on our weekly and daily uh, dispatch board. We have assets and non-asset relationships with flexibility to scale and meet your timelines. Our goal is to be the most efficient company out there with technology and solutions that help our drivers make more money, spend more time with their families, and serve our customers with quality work and the most affordable pricing we can offer. So we're very excited about where we're going. And, and thank you guys again for participating. I guess we open it up for questions now, Donna. Sounds good to me. 
Yes, and uh, we have a few questions. So I will uh, go ahead and launch them out to you, Donna and Mason, and uh, either one of you or both of you can respond accordingly. Uh, first question is from Justin O'Leary, and his question is, uh, I see warehouse storing being in greater demand than container yard storage in 2023 due to the possible recession and the final destination site not being able to receive the freight and thus storing the freight in warehouses long term. What are your thoughts? Yeah, Justin, I don't think that's a bad uh, take. The issue with that is it's very difficult for customers to put up pop up yards with container yards, but it's also really difficult to set up a trusted warehouse very quickly. In LA, for instance, I mean, the the prices that are still out there for available space, it just is reflective that there's not a lot of that out there today. So you'd have to find something with a like destination for your customer. If you're a manufacturer shipping in inland, and then if it's going to a final DC, opening up additional yard space for potentially an Easter Sunday event that's not going to be around forever. So, you know, I'm with you. I think that warehousing, if you're going to do that for long term, it gets you out of per diem. It gets you out of um, additional charges, but you also have to unload the box twice. And that can be problematic in a lot of ways. So, you know, I think it it, it just depends on the customer for what they want and, and what their specific needs are. We do definitely see that, though, um, especially on the West Coast, oh, on all of our coasts, actually. Um, our IMC, uh, PDS, um, has really done a great job at expanding in this transload warehouse space for the very reason, Justin, that you say. I think what we've also learned is that we need options. Um, I think we've learned that we need to be nimble and flexible. And um, so... Uh, I, too, think you've got a, a strong take on the current market. It just depends um, on uh, what your long-term strategy is. But, it, you know, like Mason said, um, I we, we do agree with you. Um, you know, it's just that um, as we look around the corner, quarter one, quarter two, we just need to be prepared, as I said, with a multitude of options in different modes and ways that we can move our freight. Agreed. We have another question from John Bowers. What are the forecasted biggest challenges for IMC companies in the international export import trade space in 2023? That's a I'll let you take that one, Donna. <laughs> oh gosh, you know we have the same um, the, the same concerns certainly that you do. We talked about our, our tremendous investment that we've made to respond to the market, investment in equipment, investment in our people, investment in technology. We investment in our drivers uh, and let's just take our drivers. The many increases that we gave our drivers and, you know, they deserved every single one of these increases. As for now, as we go into quarter one and the freight has waned, we've seen it, you know, can't just take those wages away from our drivers. And so we have got to continue to really push ourselves to be innovative um, and ways that we can continue to, um, to come out on top of this. So the immediate challenge is, of course, to continue to invest, continue to move forward, knowing that it's a long-term strategy um, and not this short-term pain that is so real. And, and certainly every single one of us that's on, uh, on this webinar today is feeling today. Um, anything you want to add to that, Mason? No, I, I would agree with that. I mean, when supply chain was at the hottest mark, we also had the ability to take a lot of those earnings and reinvest them in new technologies and um, keeping moving the ball forward of our industry. And I think if you're looking at it on the aggregate there, you know, steamship line rates are dropping. You know, I think everybody saw the 1200 magic number back to the West Coast. And something that we have to just be aware of is keeping those steamship line uh, guys at least healthy enough not to go out of business. And um, also that translates to the trucking community as well. We want to be able to reinvest in better technologies for our drivers and also our customers. And, you know, that's just something to think about as volumes come down and rates get squeezed. We, we need to not forget about the investment in the plan that we have as a whole, you know, industry on how we continue to move the ball forward. So um, that's my quick snippet. I, I, again, I don't want to give a, um, a, a bailout to any of the steamship lines who made a lot of money over the past few years. But, you know, let's just be cognizant of, you know, if there is uh, good investments being made, let's keep those going. How about that? 
<laughs> uh, and I think this will probably be our final question regarding uh, Glenn Harkham would like to know regarding the chassis situation is the gray pool movement gaining traction and what can drage providers do to collectively promote this change to the system? I think if you asked um, most motor carriers, they would pray that the gray pool option was uh, gaining traction. I think there's much greater awareness now amongst our shipper community how this is a <clears throat> real and viable option. Before, as motor carriers, we lived it. Um, and over the past two years, our customers lived it with us. Um, but as far as gaining traction, uh, I'll be candid. Um, we are still um, still teaching, educating, talking. Um, we, we are going to have to find a way to, um, because we have other business models that are steadfast, that they don't wanna participate in these models. And so if we take those players out of the equation, then we have got to figure out how we as a community that believes this is the best scenario, continue to path forward, working with the stakeholders, our ports, our railroads, our shippers who pay the bills, ultimate customers, how we're gonna work together and use the chassis resources that we have, best utilize them. Um, and so I'm answering your question because what I also, um, really in two ways, the great pool is much alive in the shipper and the motor carriers, many of the motor carriers' um, minds and, and wants and desires, but it's going to take more than, than just us. Why? Unlike a port that can control a gray pool environment, we look at the South Atlantic. They can control their own destiny. Look at the port of Charleston that said, nope, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have my own chassis. Look at the port of Virginia who has the Hampton Roads chassis model. In the interior of the United States, we are contingent and we count on ourselves. Um, but what's happened, as I mentioned about 10 minutes earlier, our destiny has already been predetermined for us and it's not working. And so we either need to come up with a shipper model gray pool that can resonate where we, we have our shippers with perhaps uh, shipper boards that can help us move this concept along. We have to collaborate and find enough strength where we can say, here's a, you know, we're going to put a great pool in Kansas City and continue to have op an open ended way where contributors can continue to contribute to the great pool. We have small gray pools in certain locations today, and they're very finite. Why? Because we have other players who continue to pull those assets out of that gray pool. That's part of the competition, Mason, that you were alluding to earlier, this competition of pools. Nobody wins in that environment. And so what we also see are, is this concept of trucker-owned or private uh, chassis deployment even in these inland locations that have these wheeled and partially wheeled facilities and these grounded facilities, can you imagine having to wait six hours to, to, you know, to bring in your own private chassis only so that you could put the box that you went in there for on that chassis? We have got to be able to reach to our, even our railroads, help us, help us together figure out a way that we can bring fluidity, speed, <clears throat> that whole pretty word velocity, velo velocity to the program, but without these wheels, none of us are going anywhere. So I, I hope I answered that question. It's really twofold. Um, we have to continue to bring, as I said, options to the table on chassis that are different than the ones that we have today. Great pool still alive, truck owned wheeled private chassis also becoming uh, very much an opportunity uh, for solutions. So that's my two cents for. All right. Well, Donna and Mason, thank you so very much. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar.